All right, welcome everyone to our interview today. Um, we're grateful to be being joined by Dr. Thomas Kalinchik from um, the Melbourne Brain Centre at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I'm sure most of you will rec uh, recognise Thomas, having been a regular contributor to MS Translate before. Thomas is currently attending the American Academy of Neurology Conference in Vancouver, Canada, um, and has been kind enough to give us his time uh, late at night in Vancouver at the moment uh, to talk about some of the work that he's presenting there. So, uh, Thomas, thanks for joining us, and, and would you like to tell us a little bit about the work that you're talking about while you're there? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Emma Strathclyde for this time uh, of I think it's very important uh, for the community and the Harvard's research that you mentioned this the same as you The reason why, uh, one of the reasons why I felt And two pieces of food we've completed in Australia as part of the interface cooperation. The one, one, piece of, uh, one piece is about, uh, it is, was completed by a medical student, uh, Nathaniel Lizard, and my supervision, whose uh, works joined by uh, uh, the University of Melbourne. And he has looked specifically at a very relevant and timely question of treatment of moderately advanced and advanced heart sclerosis. And one of the, the reasons for uh, asking these questions is that many regulators and many, many jurisdictions will, will limit access to therapies to patients who have reached certain disability level. And this uh, decision will often stem from a Result of a publication from about six years ago, which has shown that people who attain certain disability tend to all progress further at the same or the same pace, regardless of whether they are treated or untreated, and regardless of how quickly they go to that certain disability level. So, for example, someone would uh, develop a Significant weakness in their leg, and after that, it has been, it was believed before that these people would take the same time to reach uh, the stage when they require walking pain. Now, using the MS-based data, we have questioned this concept and we have managed to prove otherwise. It is actually highly variable uh, outcome at the time to the next physical milestone. Very importantly, there are two variables that critically determine the times of the outcome. One of them is the proportion of the, uh, the frequency of relapses that people uh, experience between uh, before they reach a particular milestone, and the second, even more importantly, is the proportion of time that people spend on highly effective therapies, such as phenolimod and and Alan Dismar. This result comes at the right time because at the moment there is a, a, uh, a heated discussion in the United States about treatment discrimination and the instrument in the United States, including clinicians and their patients, are energized and highly involved in the discussion. So I believe that uh, uh, our result can inform uh, the community. Time. The second result, uh, or the second piece of work that we are presenting here, is a result of a study where we have developed a predictive model, a comprehensive predictive model of various disease outcomes and various therapies. Uh, it is a, it is the attempt to ask a question. It is very common question in routine clinical practice of a clinical family with this sort of question where patients ask us, the doctor tell me which drug is the best drug for me in this particular situation, given my previous exposure therapies, given my previous number of relapses, previous disability and so forth, many other variables that uh, we use to describe individual situation of individual patients in the mess. So far we didn't have very much uh, 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 it's called a uh, centralized or standardized as to the 
question, uh, so mostly what we act on is the evidence that we read in scientific journals, we use our experience and uh, baby of circulation into the physical patient who sits in the clinical room with us. What we've been trying to do is to develop a statistical model that takes the advantage of uh, the one about animal studies, which start from 38,000 patients from 119 various centers, more than 200 patients. And here, this is a cumulative experience of patients that perform huge clinical decisions. And we are able to arrive at a, I have to develop a complex algorithm, which however enables us to predict individual predictions, prediction of uh, visibility, uh, progression, visibility regression, uh, ups and downs, uh, the probability of reaching secondary progressive and so forth. And most importantly, all of this for each of the currently available with these modified studies separately. So as a result of that, we are able to package that information into a pretty tool in the boards in the uh, new MSBEX platform which is currently being developed. So the clinicians, when they see their patients in the clinical room, we will be able to consult the new platform and ask the question if Mr. A was to switch therapy, which therapy are they the most likely to experience no disease activity on? So we're moving from, and this is a very important step from the current perspective, this hasn't been done very much so far. We're moving from group prediction to individual prediction, so individuals, individualized therapy. Okay, that's really interesting, and I think really useful information um, for people because as you say i mean one of the biggest difficulties is is that uncertainty and going well where do i go next if, if this hasn't worked what's my best next choice and often i guess previously people have had to say well we don't really know um, but this this gives a much more accurate way of, of being able to answer that question yes, absolutely uh, that's the entire purpose of the exercise so there's more uh, definitely a uh, the type of the research which uh, perhaps elucidates the pathology or, or, or pathophysiology of the disease, we have to admit to that, but I think something that has to offer valuable information to clinicians and we hope that it will be widely adopted by practicing clinicians. Okay, and so I guess both, both of the studies that you just talked about have reasonably big impacts for people with MS. Um, are either of those outcomes currently being utilised by clinicians? Is this expected to be sort of widely adopted um, by neurologists worldwide? Or uh, this is, these are old days. So mm -hmm. where we are at the moment with both of the model studies, we are in the process of uh, uh, scientific peer review, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, uh, as the audience would. But maybe family with uh, each piece of new evidence uh, that arrives from research centers and methods or other source needs to be first validated and, uh, and uh, exposed to a critique from our colleagues. So that's what we are going at the moment. The, the work is submitted to scientific journals, and one, once it has been published and it will available in the public domain, then we will be ready to roll it out and offer it to clinicians to utilize it in their everyday clinical practice. Okay, and so those are the next steps. I mean, once once it's published and accessible to everyone, then it will begin to hopefully get adopted around the world? Well, well that's what we hope for. Okay. Uh, the reception has been very positive from mm -hmm. various sources and various regions around the globe, so we hope that, because we are given that, reach of the NSB is that, this uh, these instruments, these pieces of evidence will not only find evidence, not only find uh, the users in Australia, but also uh, in broader audience all the other globe. Okay, fantastic and great to see some Australian research, though I guess MS based being global, but being driven by some Australian researchers having such a big impact. Um, so earlier today we posted 
um, across our social media platforms to ask people to submit any questions that they may have for you. Um, so I'll just move on to them um, now. Um, the first one, I guess, was related to um, that first study that we were talking about um, and the question of defining advanced MS and how you defined um, what was classified as advanced MS in, in the study um, and whether or not this was still people with relapsing remitting MS or whether we'd move to a progressive form of the disease. This is a, what we define as a advanced MS is a mixture. There will be certainly a large proportion of people with secondary progressive disease, but uh, we should normally focus only to this diagnosis uh, because the diagnosis has certain criteria, certain definitions around which it falls within in the medicine in implementing that research. So these are people which do not have reached certain disability level. Uh, defined by a standardized measure which is called um, uh, EBSS um, and uh, we have looked at outcomes in people with certain EBSS steps as uh, often uh, quantified by clinicians. As opposed to that, the question of, of outcomes in secondary progressive disease is slightly different question because people can reach secondary progressive disease that's fairly relatively low EDSS steps, mm -hmm. but also there will be people with people reach EDSS and at some high EDSS steps. So we didn't mm -hmm. ask the question of secondary progressive disease here, mm -hmm. but we are certainly trying to ask the question in the future. Okay, and that probably leads into the next question, which um, was um, some experts are, are saying that um, there are progressive components present at the onset of MS um, rather than a necessarily a conversion process that, that we've always sort of assumed. Um, would that have any impact on the findings that you are talking about? No, that is um, I believe that I've heard from uh, several times from Gavin Giovanni. Mm -hmm. And I have, to say, I have to say that I'm inclined to agree because it makes sense to me. It seems logical that people who have active um, severe disease early after the disease onset will be more likely to convert to secondary progressive MS later. <laughs> However, this is just my opinion. I have to remind this here is that I can't back, back with, you know, with any evidence from, for example, the MS-based analysis, where that's an opportunity for huge research. <laughs> Uh, so it would be a logical uh, assumption that treating aggressively early into this course may be beneficial from the perspective of preventing secondary obesity disease. Uh, however, this is something that still requires further clarification and evidence. Okay. Um, the next question was relating to access to MS base and, and really about who has access to that data, and specifically, do pharmaceutical companies have access to the MS-based database? So the the way MS-based works is um, uh, fairly democratic uh, structure. It is a collaboration of data owners. By data owners, I mean uh, various clinics uh, around the globe, when uh, the ownership of the data resides with the clinics. So we never, as in this case, own any data. It is all owned by, by our researchers and contributors. So where any of us as researchers is part of the collaboration uh, was to utilize the entire data for a certain purpose or to a certain end, we are obliged to apply for the data and any of the Investigators can decide not to provide data if they don't agree with the particular use of the information they own. Uh, in terms of the, the accessibility divide by the industry, uh, we have a very strict rule about not providing the information that the data, the original data to the industry. We may receive requests from, uh, 
of industry uh, to collaborate on a specific project, uh, but we never provide the interest of the actual data. But it basically can read on that analysis for uh, together in concert with our partners. Um, so the last question um, is a little bit in-depth, so I'll ask it to you in a, in a few little bits, but it relates to one of the statements um, made in, in the abstract about that, that first study that we were discussing, um, which says increased utilisation um, of high efficacy therapy, therapy AR during advanced MS are associated with a lower likelihood of accumulating significant disability. I mean, so they were looking for some clarification on those statements. Um, and the first way that they wanted that clarified was um, what was the likelihood of accumulating significant disability and how was that defined? Yes, so um, uh, the, the question has really, I think it's really interesting about what is the probability of accumulating significant disability and how we would define it. Uh, we use EBSS, uh, which is a, a quantitative scale that I have mentioned earlier today, and that's what as we will just tend to translate uh, the outcomes of clinical observation into uh, something that we are able to quantify. And we use two things, and we use something that we call EBS steps, which range from 0 to 10, and 0 is no visibility, and 10 is death due to MS. Now, uh, um, the, the, the visibility scale that we do this, and we, we, in this particular study, we work with uh, moderately advanced with advanced disability. So we look at people who have reached EDSS step 3, that means they significant, significant disability require in one, uh, um, one domain, so that is uh, having a significant weakness in the leg or significant change in sensation, harm the body, and so forth. But without impact ambulation, uh, that's the input. And the output of the analysis is the probability of reaching EDS step 6, which is the likelihood of requiring a unilateral, such as a pen or stick, to walk 500 meters. So that, the, the latter is positive to be fairly stable. Hard uh, milestone, uh, an important endpoint that uh, would be very obvious in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that if, uh, in, uh, in the observational data that for people who are treated uh, either exposed to no therapy or at best to low efficacy therapy, such as injectable therapies or some of the oral therapies, it would take uh, at, at five years from reaching media step three about. 80% of patients would not have reached even step 6, so mm -hmm. the step when they require walking aid. Whereas uh, for those patients who during that time have been exposed to a high efficacy therapy, screen body or other not according to this study, at five years it would be about 90% of patients who have not reached that step. So we're talking about different. 10% of patients who did not have reached the outcome visibility step. Even more importantly, uh, uh, we have looked at the, at the transition from EDS step 6 to 6.5. So that's the step from when people require uh, a walking aid, unilateral walking aid, to the step 6.5, which uh, corresponds to the step when people require bilateral. Just to kind of structure a walk, uh, a walk and so forth. So, clearly, even though mathematically we're talking about 0.5 years of stick, but clinically this is a very important transition from a patient for a patient because you, we're talking about someone who previously had one three hands to use when they walk around their house, whereas now they require, they need to hold on to two things while they walk and they can't really, they, they, if they want to do something, they need to sit down with their head to the arms. Uh, so functionally it's important outcome. And again, we see very similar trend from common people who reach EDS step 6 
is uh, uh, to use this for foggy later the fog. Uh, foggy is lighter after the initial register. It will be 40% of patients who have not reached the 66.5 if they were treated by uh, lower efficacy therapy or they haven't received any treatment. Mm-hmm. Whereas for high efficacy therapy, 50% of patients will not have reached the 66.5. So again, the difference is similar, 10%. And this is important, particularly, for example, here in the Living in Canada, I've spoken to many clinicians uh, who look after patients uh, here, and uh, they told me that according to the local regulations, once people have breached immune systems, they lose access to the medical service. Mm-hmm. So, from this perspective, the result is very important for the guys because it shows them that. Uh, by continuing palliative therapy even after it is step six, we can prevent further progression uh, of disability. Okay, I think that actually answers all of the specific questions that the person had. So we'll, we'll leave it as there. And, and I think that's, I think what you touched on there is a, is a really important point of. Well, they may be small grades that we're looking at in terms of EDSS. Um, you've really isolated very functionally important step um, that it that is has a huge impact on the, the quality of life for people with MS and so is is highly important. So I think that the, the research outcomes of that are, are really significant. Absolutely. All right, well, I think we'll leave it there. It's very late at night in Vancouver where Thomas is and um, as someone who's attended these conferences before, um, they can be very draining. So we'll let Thomas get some rest. Um, again, thank you very much um, for agreeing to, to chat to us about this. Um, it's much appreciated, um, not only by, by us, but I'm sure by all of the MS Translate community and um, your continued involvement um, is, is really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating. Yeah. Um, have it, enjoy the rest of the conference. I hope it's, it's really beneficial. Um, good luck with all of the, the future research, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thomas.